All right, so you just got a little notification about recording. If you could accept that, that'd be great. Um, I'm Dr. Sarah Dalton, and I'm one of the faculty members at the Chicago School and in the Counselor Education Department. I primarily work in the doctoral program, um, and I do see some people that I know and one of our wonderful doctoral students, so that's great. Um, I'm hoping that you all will feel encouraged um, yes, to come on camera. That's what I was just going to say. Come on camera and chat. Um, this is very informal. This is going to be talking about the theory troop idea that we do here at the Chicago School, but also I would love if we could talk about other ideas or things that you do related to theory in your place of work or your um, university. So I know it is the end of the day, so you're probably all relaxing and taking it easy, but if you want to come on camera, that would be awesome. So I am going to speak as a colleague, but not the idea creator of the theory troop. Um, so, so some of the faculty, I think especially Dr. Harris, came up with this idea of theory troop, which was stemmed from students being really nervous about what theory uh, their what theory they are using and how they use it and what's the purpose of using a theory in our in our field. Obviously, theory is the core of everything. But sometimes I find when I work with students, I'll say, OK, what's your theory of choice? We have a theory of choice, hopefully. And then I'll say, what intervention are you using? And usually the students don't know. So that's OK. That just means we're learning. But we wanted to come up with these um, role plays and examples so students could see a library of theories that we have available and see maybe what theory aligns with their personal beliefs, their professional beliefs, and then hopefully implement it a little bit better. So I did pull up, well, I guess I'll just share my screen. You can look at it since we've got time. <laughs> um, so I, I pulled up our YouTube page, right, Colleen? And this is what we have so far, um, which are some theories that are presented. So you can see them, systems theory, solution focus, narrative, and there's a few different parts of narrative therapy. And this is on the TCSPP Counselor Education Department channel. So this is what we have here so far. So I need to pull up the chat. Okay. Has anyone watched any of those up to this point or at all in your program or at all? <laughs> I just found myself. No, no one? Oh no. Okay, so then this is good. We're talking about this. Let's start off with a discussion. Oh, you've watched Iden's. Good, good, good. Yes, Iden is wonderful. Um, let's start off with what theory you implement into whether it's your clinical practice, your supervision, even just your, your focus of teaching if you're a professor. What are your theories? Throw them in the chat or say them out loud. Oh, yay. Thanks, Colleen. You can see the um, entire YouTube page there. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, so then there's even stuff you can watch about supervision. Oh, our presentations from the conference is wonderful. Existential says Chandra. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> I hope you know your theory because we are in class together and it's something we talk about, right? Absolutely. Yes, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Or, or if you maybe don't feel fully skilled in a theory, that's okay. What do you think you, you might wanna learn more about or implement when you do get to clinical work if maybe you're not there yet? Yes, thank you so much. Person-centered and gestalt, that's wonderful. I also think the combination is a good thing to, to have too. Relational cultural, yes, thank you so much. So, so far nobody is repeated, which is good. We all come from different backgrounds, different reasoning for our theories. If you feel like adding to that, if you, 
yes, CBT does work really well with the people in the addictions population. If you have a theory and you'd like to learn more about feminist theory, great. Yes, I was going to say, what makes you kind of drawn to these? Is it a personal belief or is it the interventions within the theory? What makes you pick this? I think I'm most interested in feminist theory because the, the name implies that it's coming at um, counseling from a, a very women-led perspective, but the actual definition of it seems to be a lot more broad mm -hmm. and just kind of social justice oriented. And that's kind of hard for me to kind of wrap my head around the name versus the actual usage of it. So I'd like to know how it actually works in practice better. I think you're really off to a nice start with it though, that the activism and the social justice piece is more inclusive than just women focused. But I think, I think that's a really good starting point, Hannah. Like I'm interested in this, I'm curious about it. So I want to know more specifics about what it means. I'm finding that my uh, interests in counseling lie uh, really heavily in social justice and advocacy. And so I'm hoping that when I do learn more about it, it ends up being a good lens to start with, but I'm also really interested in person-centered therapy. Mm -hmm. Very good. And the combination might be appropriate too for some clients. What about the rest of you? How, how did you pick the theory you have in your practice or maybe as you're picking or you're thinking about becoming a professional, what is it about the theory that resonates for you? So for me, I um, didn't realize I was much, that much of an existential theorist until I had to do a project <laughs> on it mm -hmm. and really working with patients on the here and now um, which is amazing. Um, I also am in love with Gestalt. Um, I, you know, and the more that I even look in Gestalt, um, I kind of flip flop between the two. Just in, you know, I love empty chair therapy. Um, it is, I feel like it's just so powerful um, to be able to do that with patients. And, um, and then even when I'm working with um, patients w when they are doing like um, substance abuse therapy and things like that, it, it, you know, works really well. You know, I do a lot of groups on, um, on like writing to your, your addiction, you know, things like that. So, you know, I think that they're just, it's really powerful and to be able to see, you know, how it works with patients is amazing. Can I ask just a quick follow-up? So you really picked and implemented existential because you learned more about it and it felt, did it feel the most right to you or the most applicable to your clients? The most right to me when I thought about how I, um, you know, provide therapy to patients. And as I was doing the project, I was like, oh my God, this is me. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> but I just didn't realize it at the time. Um, that it was that that much of me that I, you know, I just didn't realize it. Mm -hmm. I think that really is how a lot of us come to a theory is sort of, I guess you were forced into it with the project, but resonating with you was sort of on accident. So that's great. Thank you. What do the rest of you think? What is it about a theory that makes us pick it? Uh, I know that when I first started, it was person-centered. And um, after like going through the classes and and uh, watching the Gloria tapes, um, that was amazing in a way that, especially just thought and just thought and uh, Fritz Perls just called Gloria phony. And um, it, it, it's, it's amazing in a way that you can implement some of these theories in the like field work, um, but also take into consideration the research behind it that is like recent. Because some of these research that I found, or some of these theories that I found, um, they've implemented in the past, 
but the population from the 1970s into 2020 now is different. Mm-hmm. So um, that's what I learned in terms of um, how I develop my theory. Yes, thank you for adding that. And it actually reminds me that, you know, one of my notes in preparation for today was about the Gloria tapes and some of the other tapes that you have watched throughout your curriculum as you're, you know, you're moving through the program. They are they are well established. They've been around forever. We've used them in teaching forever, but they're a little bit outdated in terms of issues, definitely in terms of culture. Um, and so that is one of the goals and the motivations of Theory Troop is to be a lot more diverse in, in all of the ways. Um, so we do hope that maybe in the future, some of you will do some role plays for us so that we can have um, more diverse issues and theories all represented. So thank you for bringing up the Gloria tapes, but they are, they are important. Any of the rest of you have any thoughts about how we pick a theory? That's okay. Then let's think about this. Once we have a theory, we think we, you know, we've read about it. We think this suits me the best. I, th- I think I want to use this. How do we know when we're in a session that we are actually using the theory? How do we know that? Or if you are watching one of these tapes for Theory Troop, how do you know that you're seeing a theory? Yes, the actual techniques. So yes, thank you, Catherine, the techniques that are used. So we need to be looking for actual interventions and actual techniques in the session, right? Because I know a lot of us, and I did this for sure, you go through your program, you learn a bunch of stuff, you go to practicum, and then you just go off of your gut instinct, right? So you respond to clients just purely on your gut because you're nervous and you don't know really what you're doing. But when we can actually identify specific techniques within our theory, then we know that we're really using it. So any of you that feel like you have a theory that you use or you're really learning about a theory, what are some of the actual techniques that you might say, this falls within this theory? Do you happen to know? Or you could just do a quick Google search, I don't really care. This is where it gets more complicated. So take a quick second and think about it. Uh, I remember when I was working with a client in field work, I've utilized the empty chair technique and focusing on the here and now. However, there are instances when you have a theory that you have in mind coming into a session, and sometimes that doesn't work out the way it's supposed to, Mm -hmm. but that's okay because theory should not be uh, uh, what you think about what the client needs. It should be what the client needs themselves. And sometimes you'll just have to change that and meet them where they're at. Um, so if you try CBT approach, and sometimes with CBT, you'll have to use it, um, like for example, reframing and um, and uh, some psychoeducation. Mm-hmm. It just, it's, it's just, um, it has to be in the right time. <laughs> I guess you could say, and not push it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I love that. I love hearing your answers because we were together so long ago and now you're experienced. It's really, it's exciting, but you're right. We have to think about what does the client actually need and they might tell us or we might interpret. I feel like direct communication is always important. For example, I can tell what's happening isn't quite working. I'm going to do a bit of a shift. Are you okay with that? and then they know what's happening. Um, What about the rest of you when you think about techniques and interventions that fall within your theory? Do you actually know some that you're looking out for or that you want to to incorporate into sessions? Like Chandra, you said in existential, you're really thinking about the here and now. Is there anything else you can think of?
Um, I just think that when when working with um, you know with our patients, I agree with um, the last speaker that um, I really when I go into sessions, I see engage where my patient is mm -hmm. when I'm working with them, and then that's what will help me to um, to determine what I'm gonna do. You know what I'm gonna do with them. Um, you know, I just did a couple and it was a lot of processing. Um, I did a couple session just last night and they, you know, it was a lot of processing and then just trying to do a lot of talk back with them and helping them to, you know, to, you know, realize their, you know, way of making choices because, you know, she was screaming, she wanted to be able to make you know, make her own choices. And he was, and feeling like he was, you know, overpowering her. And he's like, I'm not doing that. So, <laughs> and so because of that, just trying to, you know, work them through that and helping him to understand about that freedom of choice, um, which I, I realize I do a lot of that with patients too, is that, you know, I will, you know, always say to them, you know, I strongly encourage, however, you know, this is your choice. You are the one that make the choices. You are the expert of you, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so, you know, all I can do is like strongly encourage and give you suggestions and things like that. But it, ultimately it is your decision on how you um, will make your decisions on what you will do, you know, with your life and the information that's given. That's great. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Colleen added into the chat, which I think applies right here after that comment, which is when you're looking for a supervisor or you're, let's just say you're even thinking about working with other people who come from different theoretical orientations, are you looking for something specific? So if you're maybe a student and you're looking for a supervisor, what do you look for? Do you want them to have the same theory as you or something totally different? And if you happen to be a supervisor, are you looking for supervisees who fall within your theory or something different? So I'm going to jump back in here and say this, is that I, you know, in going through my master's program and, um, and then I went through supervision in Kentucky and I had a good supervisor, a horrible supervisor, and then a good supervisor, um, which is what made me decide to go to school and get my PhD. Um, <laughs> but um, I realized in having that horrible supervisor um, that when it comes to like, I wasn't taught theory at all. We didn't do any theory. Um, you know, a lot of times she just sat there and just was kind of like, okay, what are we doing today? Um, and although I've been in the field for a long time, so I just, you know, waited late to get my licensure. But because of that, I looked at like the people that were new coming into it and what they were not learning from her, which made me concerned. So that's what made me realize even more so how much I needed to look for a supervisor where I was going to grow, um, which made a makes a difference with theory because with theory, she I didn't do any theory with her and I had her the longest because I had her for a year. So that was, you know. And I feel dis, disheartened now because of that year that I lost of not being able to grow. So you had that supervisor for a whole year and you don't feel like you implemented or were able to talk about theory? Nope. Wow. No, no, not for a whole year. She did. Um, there was like, we would sit there and she would just, and she would just like, what's going on with your cases today? And we would talk to her about that, mm -hmm. um, me and another worker. And then she'd be like, okay. And then she would, she was our director of the program. And then she would, if she received a call from another staff member, then she would pull us in to help her make a decision about that. And that was her version of supervision. Um, and at the time, unfortunately, I didn't realize that that wasn't what supervision was supposed to be, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so because of that, yeah, no theory, no, you know, um, and I was actually getting ready to take the test. And so I had to go and do all of that on my own of studying and all of that stuff on my own without being trained on any theory at all. Yes, I think, I think your experience is really 
important. And I think a lot of students could potentially fall into that same situation because they look for supervisors who are available and flexible and maybe don't ask these questions about what theory do you use? How do you implement it? And even just what supervision theory are you using? I think if you had known to ask those questions, I bet your situation would have been a little bit different. Absolutely, yeah. You would have just run, <laughs> so it would have been. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anyone external to the Chicago School that wants to offer their thoughts on students looking for supervisors and what theory they come from? That's okay, if not. John, what about for you? How did you find a supervisor? If you don't mind adding. Uh, to be honest with you, it was very hard. And so I kind of just find whichever supervisor was available in my area and go from there. Um, however, that supervisor was highly ingrained with addiction. So I learned a little bit of CBT, not much about the other theories. Um, the one thing that I had a hard time with throughout my fieldwork experiences was finding resources for those theories, um, especially uh, especially for like CBT. Um, you have to pay a lot of money, and and you know as as a student you don't have much money, and um, that was one of the hardest part. Um, you have a lot of resources, but when you do sign in, you have to pay those money. Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. Things always cost money when it's do this training or learn this this extra this extra course or something. Um, what a lot of my supervisees that I've worked with in the master's program honestly would start with a Google search. You know, the key to everything. Not that that's peer reviewed in any sort of way because it's not. But sometimes you can find really nice like worksheets or ideas. Um, I'm not a therapist who relies on worksheets and activities all of the time, but sometimes you can really find something that might align with your theory and could help spark some discussion in your sessions. But you're right, John, sometimes it all adds up. And we have a question. As a grad student with zero client experience, that is okay, that's great. How do you ultimately determine which theory you use over the course of your professional career? Let's start with that. Super great. Um, any of you who are practicing right now, do you feel like when you were in grad school, you picked a theory and you stuck with it throughout your whole entire career? Does it, not that any of us are done, I don't think, but ha, did anyone do that? Or did you transition to a different theory or add in more? I guess I could start as you all think, but I definitely myself, I started with CBT because I worked in a, a site that was very heavily addictions focused. Um, it's what my program primarily taught. We really didn't spend that much time talking about all the theories that's like we do here at the Chicago School. So I started there. And as I started working with a lot of couples and families and um, doing sort of relationship sort of focused, stuff, I really integrated a systems approach. Um, and that's honestly where I kind of lie right now, some CBT and a lot of system stuff. I think it's really normal that you would add in additional theories. You probably never ditch that first one that you maybe picked in grad school because you pick it for a reason. And it, usually because it aligns well with your personal values, like we were saying earlier, but you'll probably add on to it. And do you ever change the theory or techniques based off your the specific needs of your client? Yes, definitely you do. That's because maybe you are really focused on the here and now, and that's sort of where your mind is, like Chandra uses existential, but maybe a client really needs to go way back in time and evaluate some of that stuff. Or maybe they really need to think about how does their family all interconnect and it's more of a family systems approach. So if you were only to stick to your primary theory, you might miss out on some of the information that the client needs to discuss. And do you adapt your theory and borrow techniques from other modalities? Absolutely. And you have to remember too that if um, you have to 
you know, it is really true to meet the client where they are, because at some point a client may not be ready to go back into, you know, the past stuff. Um, again, I think about the couple that I was meeting with and I was trying to get down to, to why he, you know, was so worried all the time about his wife and, you know, and when I started trying to go into that with him yesterday when I was meeting with him and he's just like, no, that's not me. No, 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 no. And I said, OK, let me pull it back, um, you know, and then I went another route of talking to him. So, you know, in, in a session, it's going to ebb and flow just based on what's going on, you know, with the client at the time. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for adding that. Um, I also run into this issue. We were talking a little bit at, about it at the tele-supervision session, if you happen to be there the other day. But sometimes um, clinicians, when they're starting off, say that they are just an integrative everything approach. So they'll do every theory, any of the time, and they don't really have to narrow it down because they know all the theories. And I'm guessing that you can pick up on that. That's probably not the best way to go because when somebody were, if your supervisor were to ask you, tell me about your interventions, how are you using this theory? They wouldn't necessarily know because I don't think any of us can be an expert on every theory. So that's something also to avoid as a student or maybe if you're looking for a supervisor who says, I do everything, I do anything. It's a little hard to do, do it all. So do we take a couple theories? Yes. And do we take interventions from different theories? Definitely. But people, clinicians, supervisors, we need to know where those, theory, where those interventions come from. What theory is it that, that it comes from? And if you know, then that's great. You're properly using the theory. Does anyone have any thoughts on that or feel like they, you know, they want to know it all or they work with someone who says they do everything? you'll see it for sure. So if you haven't yet, it will happen. <laughs> That's a really great question. Thanks for, um, thanks for adding that. So when you are looking for a supervisor in the future for your practicum, Catherine, you'd wanna find somebody who does have a strong theory or theories that they use. And you wanna ask about how you could learn more about it when you're under their supervision. I think that's an important thing. When do any of you all have questions about implementing theory, how you hope to implement theory, any of that, so how you practice your theory, any, anything that you want, maybe Colleen and I and some of the students to, um, to answer. Kevin, I'm going to pick on you um, because you're a GA and I can, <laughs> um, but I know you're kind of in the middle of your tenure here at the Chicago School in our program, in our CMHC program. Um, so if you can kind of just voice your experience of as a new student, did you have a theory? Did you have all the theories? Have you changed your um, theory of choice? And then as you transition towards looking for a field work site kind of what's that experience been as well thank you <laughs> <laughs> i'm just a room monitor um let's see uh i think when i started i came in really kind of attracted to carl rogers work and i remain that way um but i have also kind of shifted towards existential um perspectives and then um a lot of Eastern stuff because it ties with my own history and culture and the people that I want to be working with. So it's kind of finagling some of those, which really Carl Rogers toward the end of his career was across the world in looking at expanding how person-centered works in other cultures. Um, existential kind of can hit that too. So that's kind of where my mindset has remained as I've stayed with the program. Um, and then as far as the future in terms of supervisee, um, I'm in one of those tiny states that doesn't really have anything approved. So that's 
I get to start that process and hopefully it benefits others that come behind me if there are any in Delaware, which is in dire need of counselors. Very nice. Thank you for adding that. I feel like that's a really good example of shifting throughout the program and also incorporating your personal maybe values and beliefs and then the population that you want to work with, which would all be different if you wanted to work with a totally different population. I think that's a really good example to kind of answer what Catherine was asking earlier. I think the only thing I would add too, and um, I'm going to put Colleen on the spot and say that uh, GAs are a necess necessary part of this program. And it's really a great opportunity to kind of have the connection with professors in different places. So you can get differing opinions, you can get different theories, you can see some of these things at work where we don't necessarily get to see them from just the student perspective. Yes, thank you for adding that. Um, Colleen, you know, we did that video of all the faculty talking about their theories. I wonder, do, would they have access to that? Yeah, definitely. Um, if it's not on YouTube, it can be, and I can get the link. Yeah, you should all check that out. We'll, we'll search for it and then post it if it's not up there. But the faculty often do this round the room answering a question. And there was a time that we all answered, what is our theory of choice? And so as Kevin was saying, I think all of us operate from very different theories. And if, if some of us do have the same theory, then very different populations that we serve. So that's, that's a cool video to watch and just see the many different many different combinations that people are using. So if you're starting off and you're just picking a theory, you know the major ones, right? You know, CBT and DBT, that's great. They're really, really good to start off with, but you can also see how faculty use them in combination with each other. So that was, that reminded me of that, Kevin, thank you. Yeah, and if any of you wanna be a GA, talk to Colleen. <laughs> good. Definitely. So from all of, oh, here, let me read this real quick. What do you feel like works well in trauma work? I have worked with youth involved in the criminal justice system and I feel like trauma history is a common factor. Do any of you have any thoughts about theories for trauma work? Go ahead. Well, we know EMDR to some degree, right? But the lesser, I think, um, is brain spotting from Dr. David Grant, which I think, I hope is gonna make some more headway. It's taken a while since 2012 and earlier, but. Um, Elena, are you a student or a, a professional? I just hi. <laughs> um, not a student. I just um, have taken many, many trainings um, through you guys, and so um, that's how I kind of got involved in this conference. Um, and I don't do clinical work um, any longer, but I I feel like understanding clinical perspectives and theory still can be beneficial in case management work with 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 kids. Um, and so that's why I threw that question in there. <laughs> That's great. I do think a lot of clinicians would go back to CBT, yes, and cognitive processing therapy, brain spotting that Kevin mentioned, which um, requires training. I do know that Dr. Harris does that, right? Um, so that's an interest of his. So if you're interested in that, he'd be a good person to talk to. And even, you know, being outside of the university doesn't matter. You can contact him for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and then the other thing to just really, really think about is who is the client that you're seeing because it might, it might change. If you're working with a young person of a background different than yours, you might need to first think of um, their cultural needs, right? Or you might first think of um, certain traumas and kind of work through them. So it does definitely depend, but I know a lot of cognitive work is, is where a lot of people start. I 
any other questions you guys have? Yeah, for sure, of course. Um, and in our faculty, um, Dr. Eldridge does a lot of trauma work. So does Dr. Harris. I think Dr. Brown does as well. Um, Colleen did add the link to the video, which you guys should watch. <laughs> I just want to redirect you again to our YouTube channel just so you can watch some of those videos. And I'm really hoping that we'll have some more saved in the coming weeks and months. One thing that we also do at the Chicago School is doctoral students and sometimes um, GAs and other people lead different trainings like this in the classes. So they'll go in and maybe do a demonstration. And so our theory troop goes into the classes and will demonstrate a theory like in 507, I believe, one of the beginning classes in the program. So if you happen to be from another institution and you're thinking about how do we implement theory into our work, we take doctoral students or more advanced master students and have them demonstrate for the newer students. So some of those videos are not saved here on the YouTube channel, but they are, they go into the classes and help students better understand the theory. We also have doctoral students this term um, going into master's fieldwork classes and teaching their theory of choice. And when that happens, we'll also have all of those videos we can add. <laughs> Oh yeah, I just did that last semester. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, yes. And I'm teaching that class and there's five really good students. So there'll be <laughs> there, are, there will be some good ones. So it might be something to check back on, you know, in the coming weeks. Colleen, am I forgetting anything about the function of Theory Troop that you, we want people to know? No, I think you really nailed it. It's really just supposed to be um, a great way to one, build community between students um, and faculty so that, um, again, it's not just always instructor led discussions and introductions to things um, because, you know, doc students, master students, and everyone in between um, has experiences, especially in an online program with different locations, different um, professional, personal backgrounds. Um, so we really wanted to make sure that the theory troop was comprehensive of all of that. Um, and then, you know, to be able to have these recordings for both, again, internal and external participation, um, mm -hmm. similar to the virtual conference, right? Like continuing to give back to the community. I know it sounds very cliche, but it's really just just, you know, providing another level of um, resource that um, everyone can access and relate to. So um, yeah, that's all I would add. <laughs> Perfect. So let's just think about theory in conclusion. And then you guys, if you have any questions, you can throw them into the chat or jump on, on camera. But if you're a student and you're just thinking about your theory of choice, take the time to research, watch that video of what the faculty do, um, but when you're researching, open up that theory and really say, these are the interventions that would fall under that theory. And does that feel right to you? Does that feel good to you? And like Chandra was saying, does it fit your population and does it fit your, you know, how you view yourself as a clinician? So take the time, don't stress yourself out, just research. And then when you're in practicum and internship, test them out test out those theories, see if they work, see if the interventions work, talk to a supervisor that hopefully is knowledgeable about theories. And you should ask them as you're interviewing for a site, what theory do you use? How do you use it? Why is it important? Um, how will you teach me about that theory? You're interviewing them as much as they maybe are interviewing you. Um, what do you think about theory alignment quizzes? Yeah, it's a good place to start, why not? Take, yeah, take it and find out, okay, maybe, maybe this one or two, these theories seem like they might fit me. Then when you research, you kind of have already narrowed it down and you can see if it feels right to you. I think those are helpful resources. Thanks for asking that. 
And I just want to add to, um, you know, as you're working, especially as a student in practicum and internship, work with your university supervisor as well. If your site supervisor is not meeting your needs, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why you have a university supervisor as well. So Chandra, I'm sorry for your experience. <laughs> I hope it doesn't repeat itself. <laughs> Well, no, I, now she's I not. appreciate it. It was, it was, um, but I will say that I, I was working for the U of L and, you know, they offered free supervision. And so because of that, I started off with my director who was, who was really good at the time. And, um, and then she left. And then the next person that came behind her, it was, you know, just not good at all. Um, and then I, for my last eight weeks of supervision, I had my like an amazing supervisor who was in, who encouraged me to go into um do clinical supervision um because I would just talk to her about all of the stuff that I had gone through in in my supervision so um and it, it's been great you know in the PhD program I've loved it every minute so <laughs> You don't have to say that, <laughs> but, but I do think, I do think that your experience is common, unfortunately, because when we get into professional work, it's so busy. You're just seeing client after client after client, doing everything you can to help them. And sometimes if we lose focus of what is our theory and what are we trying to do, um, you just get further away from knowing what your core theory is. And unfortunately, a lot of supervisors get to that point. Um, so if you end up in that situation where you feel like you're not really implementing theory and you're not really sure what's going on, ask your supervisor if you could recenter. Like we need to think about theory again and, and start over. Uh, and that would, that would maybe be a helpful thing to do but it's very easy for supervisors to forget even what their theory is when they're so busy day to day. Um, okay, so then we talked about as you're looking for a supervisor and you're in supervision, use every single supervisor you can, both on the site and at the university. And when you're a professional, you might have free supervision at your site, which I hope you do because that you know, nobody has a ton of money to be throwing out there. But if that supervisor is not giving you everything you need, you might want to consult with a peer group where you can talk about theories, or you might want to hire once a month a supervisor that you can talk to about theories. You're the only one that can really learn it and implement it. So if you're not getting what you need from that supervision post masters and whoever's going to sign off on your licensure, you might need to seek it out in some other places. Honestly, I wish someone had told me that. <laughs> I just had my supervisor at my site. We did a lot of that. Hey, how's your week? What, what are your clients doing that we were talking about earlier? And not a lot of focus on what are your interventions? What is your theory? What are you actually trying to do here? So look for that in your, in your supervisor. And I think that's it. And as a GA, as a student, master student or doctoral student, you can work with any of the faculty and record one of these videos, but you also can watch them and learn from them. So please use this resource um, that we have. Does anyone have any final questions before you, we let you free? <laughs> and tomorrow's the last day. So check out everything that's going on tomorrow and attend. Colleen, you have anything else? Or Kevin? No? All right. Well, thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Dr. Dalton. Yeah.